Uh, and so now it's my honor to turn the floor over to a dear friend and a mentor who's going to moderate a panel among other dear friends. And so with that, uh, Dr. Frank Moore, a professor of politics and international relations at Florida International University, uh, also a member of the Jack D. Gordon Institute for Public Policy in LAC teams. We are just absolutely honored to have him here. He served as the former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense uh, and is no stranger to this hemisphere. So with that, Dr. Mora, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Brian, for that introduction. Well, it is, uh, as they say in Spanish, I have the honor of moderating a panel de lujo, as we say in Spanish. Uh, we are very fortunate to really have uh, three senior policy advisors to three different presidents in the hemisphere, uh, presidents of Guyana, Colombia, and the United States. And, 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 and the panel is gonna sort of really try to delve in as much as we can into the security landscape of the hemisphere, particularly in light of some of the issues that were just discussed related to uh, the pandemic and the sort of social, political, economic forces that have been unleashed by, by the pandemic. Uh, a little uh, ground rule here as we're gonna proceed for the next hour and a half. I'm gonna, uh, each of our panelists will have about five to seven minutes of some brief remarks. Uh, uh, they will go in the order that I will introduce them here in a second. Uh, then we're gonna have a conversation uh, for the next uh, about uh, 45 minutes uh, or less probably. And then we're gonna open up to a question and answer from the audience. So uh, members of the audience, as, as we go through this conversation, uh, please uh, send your uh, comments or your questions via the question and answer or the chat. You can send them to me privately or to the whole group. And I'll be sure to try to get through all of them uh, or at least most of them as much as time uh, permits. Again, this is gonna be a conversation. I'm gonna ask a, a few questions and hopefully our panelists will not only react to my questions, but react to each other's comments uh, and questions. So with that, let me, let me introduce our, our stellar panelists in the order that they'll be speaking in their introductory remarks. First, uh, Jerry Govea. Uh, Jerry is the National Security Advisor to the President of Guyana, President Irfan Ali. Uh, Jerry has a long and distinguished career as a former military officer over a decade serving in the Guyanese Defense Forces as the chief, chief pilot of the Army Air Corps. He is an expert on a number of security related issues. And again, Jerry, thank you so much for joining us uh, today. Second, uh, Rafael Guarín. Rafael is the National Security Advisor to the President of Colombia, Ivan Duque. Uh, I have known Rafael for a number of years. He's an expert on a number of areas, counterterrorism, counterinsurgency. He is a journalist. He has consulted in the private and public sectors on a number of domestic and international issues. And so also we're very grateful to have uh, Rafael with us. And then finally, but certainly not least, my good old friend Juan Gonzalez, who is special assistant uh, to the president of the United States and NSC senior director for the Western Hemisphere. Juan served in a number of senior positions during the Obama administration in the State Department, in the National Security Council, and in the office of the Vice President, then Vice President uh, Joe Biden. So as you can see, great group of people, very, it's gonna be very engaging. I promise it will be very engaging as moderator. So with that, let me then turn over to you, Jerry, for your brief introductory remarks and then go from there. Thank you very much. I hope everyone is hearing me. Um, I am Jerry Govaya, and I am the National Security Advisor to President Ali. President Ali is our new minted president here in Guyana um, that has just been elected over uh, less than a year ago. And um, I wanted to, um, at this point in time, re-emphasize the strategic importance that Guyana plays with its relationship with the United States, and certainly in this region, so from a, a geo, geographic position and geopolitical position, Guyana is extremely pleased to have this relationship. Um, in fact, we, have, um, we would like to always believe that the US is our global partner of choice for us. Um, and where we are at the moment, where our country, we've just found, um, those of you who have been following, we just found extensive um, 
and vast oil reserves off our coast, which is going to completely change the economic fortunes of Guyana. Um, unfortunately, we sit next to Venezuela. And so a lot of our challenges, because Venezuela not only at this point is a, is a, is a state that is threatened internally, uh, whether it's a fragile or a weak state, um, the academics will tell us that, but certainly it poses a serious risk to Guyana because Venezuela is putting a claim to Guyana territorial integrity. They're claiming three quarters of our country and they've been threatening us militarily for the, for the longest while, but particularly in the last, I would say in the last seven months. So Venezuela has been posing a serious threat to Guyana, um, not only with that, with, that, um, with that threat, but certainly with the migrants. They have thousands of migrants crossing into our borders every day. And that is a serious problem for us because within those migrants, um, we, we have the, our ability to decipher genuine migrants and, and people who may be part of a Trojan horse um, strategy that have been trained to our country is a big, is a big challenge for us. Um, but certainly with the advent of the oil, what it does for us is that there's a large influx of US businesses in Guyana. And which means that Ghana become a, a very strategic um, a partner for the US. And I think the general spoke about people looking for the soft on the belly of US targets. And Ghana, if we don't keep our country as a safe, secure, um, a democratic country, that we could, and right sitting next to Venezuela, where you could have the development of cartels and drug, and drug gangs and so on, um, Ghana could certainly become a threat to this region joining with Venezuela. So it's very important. And I want to emphasize how important the US is to us because a year ago, during our uh, regular cycles of elections, we've had a very serious, serious threat to our democracy. And while we've never asked the United States to pick a side, we certainly asked them to, to stand with us on the side of the rule of law, respect for our constitution and democracy. And I want to say, I cannot, say thank you enough to the United States ambassador here in Guyana and the US government as a, as a, as in general to their uh, support for democracy, the rule of law and respect for the constitution. Without that, Guyana would have been a country that was, is being ruled today by an undemocratic con, uh, a government that would, that would threaten the rule of law in this region. Um, and so we are very, very committed um, to our relationship with the US. For me, as a national security advisor to the president, I see national security directly connected to national prosperity and anything along that line that affects the attainment of national prosperity becomes uh, a serious priority for me and for our government. Luckily, our president have just made a, a public statement of, of his own vision statement. He said, we are fashioning an inclusive democracy predicated upon the respect of our constitution, the rule of law and the will of the people, one in which our, our sovereignty and territorial integrity are sacred. This is a Guyana that would, that would possess a modern, robust, and diverse, resilient economy capable of delivering economic prosperity, which can be translated into higher levels of employment and improvement in the quality of lives of our people. So we are focusing on the issue of prosperity and anything that affects us. So COVID, for example, is a major national security threat for us as we, as we grapple with it. But again, the United States have been very, very helpful to Guyana in terms of the vaccine, and in terms of the uh, of advice and guidance. Um, so we are very committed. I believe, I, I also want to say I agree with the general about the issue of attachments um, into the US um, uh, military and, and, and intellectual system. Myself and Brian actually was at the National Defense University in Washington many years ago. And those relationships live a long time and it helped, it helped to foster that relationship and helped to foster an understanding of our countries and where we want to go. But I want to also say to the general that spoke before me, um, yes, the issue of ships, our EEZ is relatively unprotected. This is where our oil rigs are. We have just, um, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a struggling way, we just bought a ship from Metal Shark in the US, which was part initially of our FMS system, um, so that we could start patrolling our EEZ to protect against illegal fishing, the transiting of drugs and, 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 and people using that, that waterway in illegal ways. So we are going to, we, we just signed a contract to acquire a ship. More, we, need, we need more than one, we need a couple of these ships. We, we also just bought a helicopter from Bell Helicopter to help enhance our ability to protect our, our waterways, protect our borders. 
Um, the biggest challenge we face, of course, is the issue of border with Venezuela, which, because it's so vast, is very unprotected. And because of what is happening in Venezuela, it becomes a serious challenge for us. So the issue we are now looking into the, the, into the, into the acquisition of drones, so if we could have an eye, eye in the sky on those borders, um, because we have the syndicators that are also coming over and doing a lot of extortion gang. So we, while we are facing the future with a lot of optimism with the advent of the oil that will bring enormous amount of economic benefits to Guyana, I think we have now close to 9 billion barrels of oil sitting off our coast. And it will certainly bring a new kind of challenge. People who will come here um, looking for um, the big money will bring new kinds of criminality. And one of the things I want to say to, to the US, which we have been saying to them, is the issue of being proactive. So even as we were getting into our elections and we spoke to them about the people who we knew was going to interfere with our democracy, and we asked them about doing uh, personal sanctions, personal economic sanctions against these, people, against these people, we were told that the US only do these things after the fact. But I want to suggest that sometimes you need to be pre uh, proactive to, and preventative. And the, pre and the US did take preventative measures against people who were attacking the democracy of Guyana, and it did work. So when the US waited for a long time to do sanctions on Venezuela officials or officials in Nigeria, but that was after the fact. This time, I think the strategy worked here in Guyana where the US actually started to impose visa sanctions and possibly was going to economic sanctions against people that were attacking our democracy because our internal democracy is one of the serious threats to our, to our democracy here in Guyana. Um, and, and so, I want to say we are very pleased to have this relationship with the US. It's been, it's been growing and evolving and developing every day. And um, I, I look forward to this. I think in a few weeks or months, we, will, we are going to have the trade with military exercise here in Guyana, uh, bringing together a, a, a coalition of partners from across the world, and which is a good start in building this relationship between Guyana and the US. But I believe that the US understand the important the geographic importance of Ghana, economic, political, and geographic. And we look forward to working with the US as a good global partner. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jerry. So we now turn to Rafael Guarín, who I think will be speaking in Spanish. Rafael, are you there? Sí, así es, Fran. Mucho gusto en saludarte a todos los participantes en esta conferencia, a mi colega Jerry, al doctor Juan González, es un respetuoso saludo eh, rápidamente para aprovechar el tiempo lo mejor posible desde la perspectiva de Colombia los retos, los problemas de seguridad de alcance hemisférico el primero sin ninguna duda tiene que ver con la existencia en el hemisferio de dictaduras que se han convertido en verdaderos santuarios del terrorismo como lo señaló el comandante del Comando Sur eh, Venezuela se ha convertido en un paraíso de impunidad para narcoterroristas una dictadura representa en el caso de Colombia, pero también de América Latina y de los Estados Unidos, una dictadura representa por sus características, por su relación con las economías ilícitas, por los carteles de la droga que tienen presencia en Venezuela, pero adicionalmente por las organizaciones terroristas que desde allí eh, actúan una amenaza a la seguridad internacional. Pero la debilidad del régimen democrático tiene también que ver con la presencia de líderes populistas que a través de elecciones llegan a imponer regímenes que restringen los derechos ciudadanos, que afectan la competencia electoral hasta hacerla nula, que suprimen la libertad de prensa y que buscan perpetuarse en el poder. La democracia representativa, la democracia liberal, respetuosa de los derechos humanos, es un presupuesto de seguridad en el hemisferio y cualquier circunstancia que se aparte de ella representa desde la perspectiva de los ojos de Colombia, una amenaza a la seguridad atmosférica. Segundo, el delito transnacional, narcotráfico, extracción ilícita de minerales, se han convertido en un factor de inestabilidad, no solamente para, para estados donde se presenta este fenómeno de delito transnacional, sino en la región. El narcotráfico, los cultivos de coca, la presencia de carteles que delinquen desde Venezuela, desde Colombia, también que tienen presencia en Perú afectan no solamente a estos países, sino a la región entera. Son factores de violencia y de vulneración de derechos humanos. Son factores que afectan la democracia e inciden en las elecciones y que promueven la corrupción. Un tercer aspecto muy importante tiene que ver con el agua, la biodiversidad y el medio ambiente. 
América Latina es una potencia mundial gracias a la presencia del Amazonas y estos recursos en un escenario futuro de escasez de agua y de acceso a los recursos de biodiversidad se convierte en un elemento fundamental eh, para la seguridad internacional. Eh, con ambiciones de potencias extrahemisféricas por su control. Pero adicionalmente, y lo compartimos con la visión del gobierno de Estados Unidos, esto tiene que ver con el cambio climático como una amenaza de carácter global. El cuarto elemento tiene que ver con la presencia de organizaciones de terrorismo internacional en el hemisferio. En particular, me refiero a Hezbollah y su presencia en Venezuela, o también la presencia de vínculos con organizaciones eh, extracontinentales de carácter terrorista que existen en áreas como la triple frontera. En esa materia, Colombia adoptó la lista de organizaciones terroristas de Estados Unidos y de la Unión Europea en el Consejo de Seguridad Nacional y ha venido trabajando para intercambiar información con países aliados para enfrentar eh, dicha amenaza. El quinto punto tiene que ver con la debilidad estatal en particular que se presenta en las áreas de frontera, en las franjas de frontera de los países de América Latina. Esa circunstancia facilita el delito transnacional, facilita el tráfico de migrantes y facilita eh, que con actividades delincuenciales se amenaza la seguridad nacional. El sexto punto tiene que ver necesariamente con los efectos económicos y sociales de la pandemia. Eh, que afectan la estabilidad de las democracias, que están generando aumentos de desigualdades en una región del mundo eh, donde la desigualdad es atroz, que afecta el empleo, que afecta el bienestar social, que afecta especialmente a los jóvenes y genera escenarios de inestabilidad no solamente social y política. Los desafíos de la pandemia constituyen para la seguridad nacional de nuestros países un elemento central. El séptimo punto tiene que ver precisamente con que debemos estar preparados para el surgimiento de nuevas pandemias. Las pandemias son claramente hoy una amenaza a la seguridad nacional de nuestros países y esto requiere desarrollar capacidades que hasta el momento no, no, no se cuentan. El octavo componente tiene que ver con la ciberseguridad. Y quiero señalar... El octavo elemento tiene que ver con la ciberseguridad. Me refiero especialmente a lo que tiene que ver con la doctrina Yerisomov de Rusia, de la guerra híbrida, y que se está traduciendo en América Latina en la injerencia en asuntos internos con el fin de desestabilizar las democracias del continente, utilizando especialmente... Eh, el mundo cibernético y esto se hace de diversas formas una que tiene que ver con la acción de estados o la acción desde territorios eh, extranjeros y lo segundo situaciones tan delicadas esto ya en el plano puramente de la ciberseguridad y de la acción eh, delincuencial como los ataques que se presentaron en los últimos días sobre el producto colonial en los Estados Unidos afectando la fuente de producción de la mitad de, ga de la gasolina de la costa este de los Estados Unidos, atacando infraestructura física crítica. No son, no son casos aislados. Les doy este dato, por ejemplo, Ecopetrol, la empresa más grande eh, de Colombia en materia eh, de petróleos, sufrió en los últimos días, en un solo día, Fran, 70 millones de ataques cibernéticos. No bueno, el tema que se ha mencionado acá por eh, mi colega de Guyana, todo lo que tiene que ver con la migración, una migración que como resultado de la dictadura y, y anular las libertades y la democracia en Venezuela, tiene cerca de dos millones de venezolanos viviendo en Colombia. La respuesta del presidente Iván Duque y de su gobierno ha sido la de brindarles protección, tener un enfoque humanitario, por eso se ha emitido un estatuto de protección temporal, pero sin duda esta es una situación que afecta a la estabilidad económica y social de una nación como Colombia, pero también permite en una frontera de más de 2.000 kilómetros de imposible control el acceso desde Venezuela de organizaciones de crimen organizado. Y finalmente, llamar la atención eh, eh, sobre la evidente injerencia extracontinental que busca afectar los intereses de Estados Unidos, 
que para el caso del gobierno de Colombia eh, tiene relación con sus valores y su visión de defensa de la democracia y de las libertades, que busca promover e imponer regímenes contrarios a la democracia, afines a intereses extracontinentales, o que busca capturar áreas económicas estratégicas en la región, lo cual afecta, por supuesto, la soberanía y la independencia en el mediano y, plazo, mediano y largo plazo de nuestros estados. Estos son 10 puntos iniciales. Seguramente en las preguntas podríamos profundizar sobre alguno de ellos. Muchas gracias, Fran. No, gracias a ti, Rafael. Excelente. Eh, Juan, turn it over to you. Thanks, Frank. Um, and thank you, Brian and FIU for hosting what is, I think you're on your sixth conference. It's been, uh, uh, I think, the only game in town to have some of these really important conversations as they relate to, to security in the hemisphere. I was struck by the, um, if you look at the agenda that you all have lined up, it, it shows how the conversation over security has evolved significantly in recent years, not just as a result of the pandemic, Um, you're going to have Dr. Fauci actually come and talk about, about these sorts of issues, but also the issue of climate, the future of the Amazon, and security challenges as they relate to kind of the interlinkage between political and security issues shows that, you know, we're not just talking about drug trafficking, but really having a much more sophisticated conversation about a, a topic that is a lot more complex and that requires an informed and coordinated response. So really, congratulations to FIU for, for putting together such a solid agenda. Look, I um, it's uh, I figured this might be an opportunity to do a really quick run through what, what I thought, I think we've accomplished over our first 100 days in this administration, very quickly, um, and then uh, talk about, I think, some of the challenges and approach to the region that we are taking Um, since we are going to be hosting the Summit of the Americas, it's, uh, it's an opportune time to really think about what our priorities should be as a hemisphere, particularly in the security space. So, you know, the president and the vice president inherited a massive crisis and an economy in disrepair, and their response is nothing short of, I think, um, historic. Uh, the focus to actually um, combat the pandemic. Um, and I think it's over 200 million Americans have been, have been vaccinated, um, has been something that the president ran on and, and committed to, to actually getting the pandemic under control. The focus on uh, economic recovery in the United States is not just a domestic issue, but a global issue, uh, because it is actually something that benefits the countries of the region is, is something that we're now starting to talk about the, the Biden recovery here. Um, and Not just that, but you have an administration that has returned to the multilateral space by going back to the World Health Organization, by returning to the, the COP and, and leading a, a leader's climate conversation that brought together countries across the political spectrum from Argentina to Brazil um, behind some very ambitious uh, commitments to combat uh, climate change. Um, we really reaffirmed our Our focus in our the importance of North America and in, in our um, engagement with our partners in Canada and Mexico, the, the first countries that we have shared vaccines with, because we recognize that uh, for the United States to fully recover from the pandemic and recover economically, our immediate neighbors need to have the pandemic under control. Um, so in that regard, the countries of North America are part of our domestic response in, in many ways. We have um, You know, followed through on our commitment to depoliticize um, U.S. policy toward Venezuela. In that regard, the president provided temporary protected status to Venezuelans already in the United States, and we've sought to really expand a, a multilateral approach in close coordination with you know our key allies like Colombia on the way forward to promote free and fair elections uh, through a negotiated process in the country. Um, and uh, we are now pivoting toward. The, uh, you know, the global response to the pandemic where the president announced that we were going to provide 60 million vaccines in AstraZeneca to, as a kind of an initial effort to help the countries of the world and Latin America being one of those priorities um, and, uh, um, and, and hope to actually roll out a, a strategy in the, in the near future that responds to what has been impacting the countries of, uh, of the region. But I, I, I just came back from a... Um, a visit to Mexico where we 
kicked off a dialogue on law enforcement cooperation with the Mexicans. And I think it is um, testament to the approach of this administration that when we, when we went to talk with the, the foreign minister and his team, we talked about the shared responsibility that the United States has in, uh, in addressing uh, security challenges. We recognize that, that the drug problem in Mexico is partly, is in large part, a issue of demand in the United States and a supply of weapons to Mexico. And so the conversations we had while we were in Mexico really were revolved around how issues like the Merida Initiative and our efforts to review them and, and think about the way forward have to look at not just the map of Mexico and the, and the challenges, the shared threats that we're facing in Mexico, but really look at what the United States is doing to address some of these challenges and, and look to derive any lessons that we can from Mexico. And that, I think, underscores the importance of shared responsibility and of close collaboration with, with key allies. And we have uh, on the issue of migration, which has really been dominating um, a press coverage of the US-Mexico relationship in particular, is one where the United States and, and Mexico are aligned more than I think many people think, and that we've actually been able to secure uh, cooperation with Mexico without threatening to close the border, but actually engaging them as the important partner that they are um, along issues of shared interests and, and, and in, a, in a forum where we actually, there's a give and take where we take their feedback, we provide them with feedback and we are, are constantly working together from a reservoir of goodwill to, um, uh, to try to address this issue together. Um, but look, uh, when, I, when I think about kind of the summit of the Americas and, and what conversations we're gonna have a year from now, with everything that's going on in the region, uh, obviously, the hemisphere is experiencing a once-in-a-century economic and political crisis that was not the result of the pandemic, but obviously was some of the issues were heightened uh, by the pandemic. And with the exception of, of countries like Chile, which recently elected uh, representatives to a uh, con constituent assembly to rewrite the, the country's constitution, um, a lot of the challenges, political, economic, and social in the region remain. Um, you know, one in six people aged 18 to 29 have left, uh, have lost their, their jobs. Um, you have uh, cartels that have taken advantage of, of the restrictions and have expanded and, and strengthened uh, themselves in, uh, as a result. Um, you have a, a region that is not prepared for the global energy transition that the, the world is undergoing. We, have a, we continue to depend significantly on commodities and the demographic changes that are impacting the region um, are ones that um, are gonna impact productivity. A statistic is actually the uh, gross domestic product increase of the last 15 years in Latin America has been largely a function of population growth, not of any uh, particular policies that have been undertaken by the countries of the region. And, and as the country kind of goes off its demographic dividend um, the, reaches the end of its demographic dividend, there are concerns about the region's ability to increase, uh, to, to grow economically and to share prosperity. So as I think about kind of our agenda for the summit, obviously it all has to start with a pandemic response. And that's something I already mentioned is gonna be a top priority for this administration to organize a hemispheric response to the pandemic, not, not by simply sharing vaccines, but also by um, helping increase and expand production and manufacturing capability by you know, recognizing that the pandemic has, has laid bare the weaknesses in the health systems in the region is trying to figure out how we can prepare for the future pandemics by coordinating much more closely. We have a North American plan for animal and pandemic influenza. We're looking to uh, update that with Canada and Mexico, but we should be talking as a region about how we can prepare for these sorts of crises. That's, that's the first one. The second one is that when we talk about climate, um, or frankly, any issue that we talk about with the region has to center on uh, the importance of economic development and economic opportunity. And so we should be having a conversation about how, what a green recovery looks like in, 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 uh, in Latin America. And, and this administration is already starting to prioritize its investments in um, international financial organizations, the Development Finance Corporation are really focused on um, and a broader energy matrix and actually helping facilitate that transition um, that, the, that the world is undergoing. And then last but not least is really how, um, given that the impacts of the pandemic have really called into question some of the, um, the even the political model that the, the region has is, is really, really need to reaffirm 
the hemispheric consensus in favor of democracy. And that is beyond just elections, it really is about, um, uh, as uh, Dr. Warin mentioned, combating disinformation to making sure that external actors are not influencing the, the uh, um, or undermining the, the will of the people to select their own leaders. It means a uh, renewed commitment to combating corruption, regardless of who's in power, our, our friends or, or people that we don't, you know, leaders that we don't agree with. And it um, also bolstering democratic institutions is going to be something that is key because um, I think when, when we talk about some of the challenges to democracy in the region, it has, is really a function of, um, I think, some of the failure of our governments to deliver the goods of democracy. And we really have to think about how, uh, uh, how is, you know, hem hemispheric countries, we, we need to do a much better job at making sure that the benefits of economic prosperity are much broader base, that everybody has access to justice, that education is not a, a function of, of, your, of your last name, but rather of, you know, of hard work. Um, and, and some of these issues are ones where, and I'll, and I'll stop here, is these issues of social justice that um, the region is facing, these protests, um, are ones that we, we are going through in the United States as well. You know, the protests last year, um, and even the debates that we're having this year about how the U.S. democracy delivers is, is, is one that we should be having together. We certainly don't have all of the answers at the United, uh, as the United States, but when it comes to security, democracy, climate change, pandemic response, all of these are issues that we have to depart from a, from a, um, a place of shared responsibility, of partnership, and ones where, where you know, we have to work together to find the, the, the answers. So. Uh, look forward to the discussion again. Thank you again for the for the opportunity. Great, thank you so much, Juan. Excellent. So uh, my plan is to ask uh, some uh, each of you individual questions, but I do want to start with a sort of question that I hope you can address, and I really want to delve in deeper into this point that Rafael and, and Juan raised, which is sort of the crisis of governance of democratic governance facing facing the region, right? Uh, since 2003, the OAS sort of developed uh, the Declaration of Security, right? That probably needs some, some updating, but it was a rather sort of broad, um, in some ways ambiguous, but nonetheless very broad understanding of what security, which they included poverty and lack of educational opportunities and so on and so forth. And it seems now that, as, as I think Rafael and, and, and Juan noted, that the pandemic has sort of exposed the pre-existing conditions of these structural challenges that the region has faced, creating security challenge. So this is not just simply a political problem, it is a security problem. So Rafael, I wanna start with you and then, and then to go to Jerry and then with Juan, which is at the end of the day, the challenge here is not between left and right. This is, we're not facing an ideological problem here. We're facing a problem between, as you mentioned Rafael, sort of liberal democracies, right? and non-democratic forms of governance that we are starting to see, and that are in some ways this kind of populism responding to the discontent and the frustration that we've seen in Ecuador, Chile, and in your own country. So if, if we can just delve deeper into what are the implications of that, one, and two, how do we get out of it, right? What is, how do we address these structural challenges so that when the next pandemic, as you said, Rafael, comes, we will be better prepared to uh, confront them. So Rafael, with you first, then Jerry, and then end with Juan again. Las, las democracias en, en América Latina son relativamente jóvenes. Después de las dictaduras de los años 60, 70, la gran promesa para los ciudadanos de América Latina era las democracias. Pero las democracias no lograron eh, generar eh, una buena distribución de los beneficios eh, sociales y económicos, a lo cual le aludía ahora eh, Juan González. Y esto ha generado, evidentemente, un desencanto democrático que desde finales del siglo anterior y comienzos de, de este, llevó a que en distintas regiones se asumieran eh, decisiones en las urnas a través de las cuales llegaron líderes populistas y profundamente antidemocráticos a imponer eh, regímenes eh, que violaban los derechos humanos o que violan los derechos humanos, porque en algunos casos, como el de Venezuela, se mantienen o restringían las libertades eh, públicas. Definitivamente el tema de, 
la crisis de representación de los partidos políticos que se vivió en esos casos, pero que además es generalizada porque obedece a los cambios eh, propios de la sociedad, a las velocidades distintas entre la economía de mercado y el trámite de las demandas políticas a través de los mecanismos democráticos, a la insatisfacción ciudadana ante demandas sociales que no son satisfechas, ante la debilidad del Estado y de los gobiernos para tomar de manera absolutamente soberana y unilateral decisiones que hoy se, con, se toman en contextos de economía de mercado en escenarios eh, multilaterales o de organizaciones internacionales, pues ha puesto a las democracias en una situación difícil y compleja. Eso sumado a que hoy tenemos nuevas tecnologías de la información, los ciudadanos eh, saben mucho más que lo que los políticos y gobiernos creen que saben, tienen muchas fuentes de, de información, no solamente los grandes medios de comunicación, y esta eh, nueva situación de tecnologías de información también se ha convertido en una oportunidad para la desinformación como una práctica sistemática dirigida a erosionar la legitimidad de las democracias y de los gobiernos. Ciertamente, estamos frente a un problema de orden político. Si bien tiene manifestaciones de violencia, que en el caso colombiano están asociadas a perturbaciones graves de orden público, lo cierto es que aquí tenemos ante todo un problema político con impacto en seguridad. Político porque se ha venido eh, deteriorando en la región la legitimidad de las instituciones democráticas, por lo que mencioné anteriormente. Y eso ha facilitado que eh, se utilice la desinformación, se utilicen estrategias a través de redes sociales y de medios de comunicación para agudizar los conflictos sociales y para erosionar cada vez más la legitimidad del Estado y las instituciones democráticas. En ese contexto confluyen actores políticos en democracia, actores ilegales asociados a economías ilícitas o a grupos terroristas, pero también actores eh, extrahemisféricos que tienen intereses geopolíticos en la región. El esfuerzo acá es enorme porque tenemos un desafío y es el de reforzar la, la institucionalidad democrática, fortalecer la legitimidad del gobierno y del Estado, y eso solamente se puede hacer con un respeto total y absoluto a los derechos humanos. Mire usted, en el caso de que está viendo Colombia en esta semana de graves perturbaciones al orden público, que han sido antecedidas por eventos en 2020, 2019 y 2018, el gran cuestionamiento que se está haciendo al Estado colombiano tiene que ver con los derechos humanos. Y lo cierto es que el gobierno del presidente Duque tiene como, tiene como criterio fundamental en el ejercicio de cada una de sus acciones, el respeto absoluto a los derechos humanos. Y no puede ser distinto, porque la legitimidad del Estado, la legitimidad de los gobiernos, la legitimidad de la seguridad, la legitimidad de la fase de la policía, reside estrictamente en el respeto absoluto de los derechos humanos y de las libertades públicas. Por eso, toda una campaña internacional muy fuerte para desprestigiar a la fuerza pública, para desprestigiar al gobierno, para tratar de eh, crear la idea. Rafael, Rafael, estás sin mute. Estás sin mute, Rafael. Estás sin mute. ¿Ahora me escuchan? Sí, sí, ahora sí, ahora sí, gracias. ¿Dónde, dónde quedé, por favor? Estabas hablando de los ataques a las fuerzas públicas en Colombia. Sí, entonces es un ataque contra la legitimidad, contra la legitimidad de la democracia, contra la legitimidad del gobierno, contra la legitimidad eh, de la fuerza pública. Y ahí la respuesta, la única respuesta posible por parte del gobierno de Colombia es transparencia absoluta, transparencia absoluta, administración de justicia rigurosa frente a aquellos casos donde en efecto eh, un servidor público, un miembro de la policía o un miembro de los militares puedan violar los derechos humanos. Aplicación rigurosa de la Convención Americana sobre los Derechos Humanos y la Jurisprudencia Constitucional que establece que no será la justicia penal militar, sino la justicia ordinaria la que investigue de manera independiente eh, tales hechos, ratificando de esa forma con acciones 
que en Colombia hay una política de seguridad y un gobierno que entiende el cumplimiento de su misión constitucional sobre la base del respeto absoluto a los derechos humanos. Ciertamente es un problema eh, complejo, es un nuevo escenario de conflicto para el cual Colombia ni los países de, del hemisferio están preparados, pero la respuesta solamente es una, desde el punto de vista del presidente Iván Duque y de su gobierno, y es fortalecer la institucionalidad democrática, fortalecer el principio de separación de poderes, fortalecer el principio de un Estado de Derecho que limita el ejercicio del poder y poner los derechos humanos un elemento fundamental. Gracias, Rafael. Jerry. Go ahead, Jerry. Oh, sorry, you. Um, all right, I was at a disadvantage a moment ago because I, I didn't switch my language to English, but I, if I understand the question correctly, you were discussing the issue of democracy and, and the importance of, um, of democracy to security and to prosperity. Well, I think if you, if you look at Guyana in the, last, in, within, in the last year, we had an election here in 20, in 2020 in March. And before that, we had a no confidence motion in our parliament. That was a legitimate uh, vote that happened in parliament. We have 65 members of our national assembly and 33 of them. The government had 30, the government was uh, in a minority in parliament. So they had 32 in the government side and 33 on the, on the on, sorry, the government was 33 and the opposition was 32. The opposition was able to win one member of the opposition to vote with them for the no contents motion and no contents motion was passed legitimately. Um, the government of the day decided to disregard and disrespect that vote. And they took the matter to court and tried to change the mathematics. They tried to say that, that 32 was not the majority of 60 of 65. They took the matter all the way to the courts. They went to our, to our, 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 um, our uh, high court to rule that it that 30, 33 is the majority of it, our appeal court overruled that and said that it had to be 34. And then we finally went to the, to the Caribbean Court of Justice that, um, that ruled that, 30, that 33 is the majority. So it took, us, it took us almost one year to have the result of the no confidence motion, um, which meant that we were supposed to have elections within, within three months of that vote. But democracy became a serious matter of threat for us uh, from 2018 into, into 2019, and then we end up in 2020, where we had the, 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 our, our elections. The elections went very, very well. All the international observers were there. And then, unfortunately, we had elements in our elections commission system um, that attempted to rig the elections. I will tell you that if it was not for the Western powers, if it was not for the United States and Canada and the UK um, and the European Union ambassadors, that was there inside. Guyana today would have been ruled by a, a government that was not uh, elected fair and free in a democratic elections. And those, those issues um, was a serious concern to us because of course, Guyana is on the, uh, on the threshold of a massive economic transformation with our oil. And if you understand that without the rule of law, without a government that respects the constitution and respects the rule of law, how close we came um, for going to, to, to joining Venezuela as two fragile and weak states, which would have then undermined the regional security and become a serious problem for the US. Luckily, the US stand their ground in terms of insisting on the rule of law, insisting on respect for the constitution. And when, they, and when there were elements who were continue and determined not to obey the rule of law, um, the U.S. started to impose personal uh, travel sanctions on them and was about to go. And these were preemptive. And I thought it helped save the democracy of Guyana. Today, the relationship with the U.S. is as solid as it's ever been, particularly in the Western world, particularly because of the stand of the United States government and the rest of the Western powers, Canada, the U.K., and the European Union, and CARICOM on the issue of, of the rule of law and democracy. Without that, so today we are very, very pleased that our country is ruled by a government that is elected by the people and that embraces democracy, embraces free enterprise, 
open for investment. And, but without democracy, those things would not have been. Only within the last week, we've had now the leader of the same, the, 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 um, the, the general who was in charge of the government in the last, in the last government is now saying that we should no longer embrace the Caribbean Court of Justice, that we should stop our justice system and election systems only at our appeal court, the appeal court that ruled that 34 was a majority of 65 and not 33. And so every day we are facing issues, challenges to our rule of law and democracy. And I believe it's important that the Western, the Western, um, uh, the Western countries, especially by the United States, continue to hold politicians' feet to the fire and people who are insistent, insistent on, on violating the rule of law and trying to take these countries down a path of, of an absence of democracy, that they should, feel, um, they should feel the penalties by the Western powers. So I think it's very important and we were saved. Guyana was on the, on the threshold of going down a sliding in a spiral. We were saved on our democracy today is very safe on the, the future for our economic prosperity and for our national security um, in partnership with the US is very, very solid because of that. Thank you, Jerry. Okay, back to you, Juan. Great, thanks. No, I, um, I, I wanted to answer your question by actually pointing to a question we got from Damian Merlo on, on El Salvador, why it is that we are um, giving a hard time to a popular leader who's actually addressed uh, kind of the country's uh, security uh, situations. And I, I, I want to say two things. First is, um, and Frank, I hope this impresses you. I'm going to quote Reinhold Niebuhr. Uh, the, you know, that saying that is attributed to him, the man's capacity for justice makes democracy possible, but man's inclination toward injustice makes democracy necessary. I'll tell you that there is um, there has been a, a tendency in this hemisphere, and I include the United States in that, to express selective moral outrage over undemocratic practices. That if somebody is is aligned with us ideologically, we will overlook certain actions, and if they are not aligned with us ideologically, we'll take particular umbrage at certain actions. And I think that's part of the that's part of the problem. You know, if if you look at a leader like um, like Bukele, who is probably one of the, the most popular leader right now in the hemisphere. He was a very successful uh, mayor of San Salvador. Um, but, and I'm not making a comparison here, but if you look at 1959, Fidel Castro was a very popular leader and uh, Hugo Chavez was a very popular leader when he was elected into office. And so really popularity should not be a carte blanche to work outside of, of the democratic institutions that are in the country, no matter how challenging or how corrupt the actors are that you are, that you are um, you know, combating. So I think when it, when it comes to matters of democratic governance and the crisis of democratic governance, you know, we want the success of, of Bukele. We want him to succeed in everything that he is actually trying to accomplish. He was elected democratically, but we are committed to a, process into democratic institutions, no matter what ideology um, a, um, you know, of a country, of a country's particular leader. Um, so if, you know, if we're critical of, of somebody like Abu Kele, um, that actually gives us credibility to be critical of, of Daniel Ortega when he's doing what he's doing, which is to essentially change the rules of the game in his favor, because he does not want to allow the, the people of Nicaragua to, to actually select who their leader will be. Uh, and so I think we just have to be consistent in that approach. That's the first thing. The second one is that, is that if that democracy does not deliver, then what good is democracy? It's really a question. And that's something that here in the United States, the president had, you know, mentioned in his uh, address, joint address before Congress, it is something that um, in the region is a debate we're, go we're going through, which is these massive protests. Yes, there are external actors, uh, I think, that are trying to make them worse. They're promoting violence. I've seen the images of people throwing acid at Colombian police. But also, as, as Dr. Gordin has mentioned, a, a commitment to ensuring peace, pe uh, the right to peaceful protest is key, not maligning those peaceful protesters for 
for really what they're protesting for, which is more opportunity. They want, um, you know, they, they want their governments to respond. I think that is something that we, we face here in the United States as well. Um, uh, but also making sure that security forces are, are being held to a, a higher standard of, of behavior um, and that, you know, we are being transparent, as Dr. Guarín mentioned, making sure that we are investigating any sort of abuses. That's true in the United States. It's true in Colombia. It's true in Mexico. It's true everywhere that we really have to make sure that, number one, we are consistent in the application and the exercise of democracy to make sure that everybody has those those rights. Uh, it's, it's written in the Inter-American Democratic Charter, right? And number two, making sure that the democracy is, is, is a, a model for development in the region is actually one that is delivering concrete benefits. Um, and, you know, I think the, the debate is out about how we can actually do that most effectively. Uh, when it comes down to the point of view of the president, the vice president, uh, I think um, our response to the situation in the Northern Triangle is, is I think, a, um, a good way to characterize our approach to the region. I think we, the, the President and Vice President Harris, um, they don't believe that you can actually solve the problems of the United States by lifting up a wall and by ignoring our international humanitarian obligations. We believe that when, the, when our neighbors are prospering and when they're safe, that the United States is prospering and the United States is safe and that we need to actually invest in the, in the future of our neighbors if we actually are to pretend to, um, to prosper and to be safe. And so um, that is why, you know, in addition to actually enforcing our immigration laws, investing in addressing the root causes as a, as a proposal for partnership with the region is, is one where we really see as the only sustainable approach to, to, so whether it's migration or any other sort of threat that the region um, is facing. But I'll say this as well, and, it, and it's not specific to your question, Frank, but I wanna touch upon it is the vice president's approach to, the, to this root causes agenda actually has been uh, where she's trying to do something that is new for the region. Um, and that may seem common sense to, to the students and the people that are watching, but you know, the United States um, has committed to providing $4 billion over four years but we recognize that no amount of money from the United States is gonna uh, transform the situation on the ground in the absence of political will. And so obviously we're you know, uh, proposing a, uh, a plan of partnership with the countries of the region, but she's also talking to um, members of the international community, to international organizations, international financial institutions. She's been talking to philanthropies. She's been talking to civil society, all to try to develop uh, Kind of a unity coalition to address these issues in a coordinated fashion, and that is incredibly challenging to do. But it's something that um, you know, obviously, the the office of the vice president of the United States has um, a great convening authority, and 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 taking that approach in a way that um, underscores the importance of bipartisanship here in the United States really is is what led to the success of um, initiatives like Plan Colombia uh, that have actually helped a key partner come back from a challenging point in its here history and, it, and we hope to actually apply a similar approach um, uh, to, to the countries of, um, of the Northern Triangle, but also frankly to our approach to the region in general, over. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Juan. So let me have, uh, we're sort of running out of time and I do want to leave time for a question. And so I have just one more question for me. And this is a question for Jerry and for Rafael. Um, the Biden administration, has been, I think, pretty clear as to their approach to Venezuela. And I think Juan has made certain statements in interviews where he's made that clear. Uh, Jerry, uh, Rafael, in terms of Venezuela, uh, you two made reference to your neighbor, uh, um, but I'd like to hear about what your governments, your presidents think is the best way ahead in terms of dealing with the multiple challenges, crises uh, uh, that confronts you and the hemisphere with respect to Venezuela. So Rafael, why don't I start with you and then go to Jerry. And if Juan wants to add something, uh, I'll, we'll give him that opportunity and then we'll go to your questions. Bueno, muy, muy buena pregunta y muy provocadora pregunta. Eh, Fran, 
eh, el, el presupuesto sobre el cual se ha elaborado la política del presidente Duque con relación al régimen de Maduro es, lo repito, que la existencia de dictaduras en el hemisferio constituyen una amenaza a la seguridad y la paz internacionales. Porque las dictaduras se fundamentan en la violación de las libertades y de los derechos humanos y hacen nulo el régimen democrático. Y eso implica distintos escenarios de desestabilización, como los que se están enfrentando con el caso hoy en Venezuela. En este país, la migración masiva, resultado de andar las libertades y de la gravísima situación social de empobrecimiento absurdo que vive el hermano pueblo de Venezuela, ha llevado a una migración que ha llegado hasta Chile y Argentina, y que en el caso colombiano tiene un enorme impacto en términos de seguridad, pero también en términos económicos y sociales. Pero adicionalmente, un régimen que no respeta el Estado de Derecho, ni los derechos humanos, ni la democracia, ni sus aspectos centrales que la caracterizan, pues permite todo tipo de eh, alianzas y relación con distintos actores vinculados al delito transnacional y al terrorismo y a las economías ilícitas, como está ampliamente demostrado en distintos escenarios internacionales. No gratuitamente eh, Estados Unidos ofrece una importante recompensa por la captura de Maduro o por la cabeza del cartel de los soles, el señor Diosdado eh, Cabello. Esto es importante tenerlo claro, porque cualquier salida debe reconocer la naturaleza del problema. Y aquí estamos frente a una dictadura con eh, vínculos y participación directa en delito trágico y que eh, viola abiertamente la resolución 1373 del Consejo de Seguridad de las Naciones Unidas del año 1001 al brindar eh, santuario de protección organizaciones terroristas y patrocinio, como es el caso de la dictadura de Maduro. Dicho eso, ¿cuáles son las líneas de respuesta? La primera que debe ser absolutamente clara es en el marco del derecho internacional y a través de, de la aplicación de los instrumentos internacionales y de la diplomacia, la cooperación y el liderazgo de países como Estados Unidos y de países que en la región o en otras partes del mundo están comprometidos con los principios y valores de la democracia liberal. Este es un punto esencial, esencial. Cualquier camino para lograr el retorno a la democracia en Venezuela debe hacerse sobre la base de la diplomacia y la aplicación del derecho internacional. Eh, segundo, es muy importante aplicar los instrumentos que el mismo derecho internacional eh, proporciona. Es extremadamente grave que eh, en Venezuela el régimen siga violando eh, como política de Estado de manera sistemática y planificada los derechos humanos y la comunidad internacional no haya sido eficaz en eh, evitar esa circunstancia. O que el régimen siga eh, en abierta cooperación, complicidad con organizaciones de, de terrorismo y no se estén aplicando con rigurosidad los instrumentos que tanto a nivel eh, la, eh, hemisférico como a nivel eh, global existen en distintas eh, resoluciones y convenciones internacionales contra el delito transnacional o contra el terrorismo. Eh, eso significa que debemos trabajar mucho más en cooperación para eh, instaurar, la, instaurar, la, instaurar, la, instaurar la democracia, ser mucho más eficaces en escenarios multilaterales no dejar de ninguna manera de ejercer presión a través de la diplomacia y del derecho internacional sobre el régimen, no eh, legitimar de ninguna manera la dictadura y las violaciones a los derechos humanos, eh, eh, respaldar eh, cualquier eh, mecanismo, cualquier línea de acción que cumpla con estos eh, criterios anteriores. La salida está en la cooperación internacional en que haya decisión política, eh, práctica, práctica, pragmática, de brindar eh, eh, una salida que permita el retorno a la democracia en Venezuela, pero sin, ningún, le, sin ninguna legitimación de ninguna forma al régimen de Maduro. Gracias, Rafael. Uh, Jerry, uh, same question to you. 
Yes, thank you very much. We are, in fact, in the firing line of the Venezuelans. The Venezuelans have been violating our sea space. They've been violating our airspace. They had jet fighters in our, in our airspace. They, they have put warships in our waters. They have been seizing our, our fishing vessels. And, and they have been interfering sometimes in our oil exploration. They are claiming a lot of our, our EEZ that doesn't belong to them, but they're using their military might. And that is pre presenting us with a very, very serious problem for Guyana, because of course, we cannot respond in it, and we can't hope to respond to them in any shape or form from a military standpoint. Um, so we depend on our bilateral relations with CARICOM, with the OAS, with the United States, um, the United Nations to try to keep them at bay. Even, even as we speak, there's a, we, 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 we took the matter to the International Court of Justice to have this matter resolved. But because of what is happening in Venezuela, it's also uh, posing serious problems and stretching our security forces limits in terms of the syndicates crossing our border. Whatever is happening in a country like Venezuela at the moment where the rule of law and the, 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 the and you're calling into question the, 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 the state, but it's a fragile or a weak state. It is presenting a serious security problem for Guyana. And we are working with our bilateral partners and particularly the US. Um, they are very, very uncomfortable every time the US is involved in some type of military exercise with Guyana. But every time it happens, they back off. Um, they, will, they will make a lot of noise, but they do not do the incursions they've been doing. And so, our relationship with the with the Western with the Western world, and particularly the United States, is very crucial at this time because we are not only facing a situation with Venezuela with their migrants, but we are facing a direct aggression on our territorial integrity by the Venezuelans. They've actually seized a part of an island that belongs to Guyana on their border, and they've been occupying it now for close to 50 years, and they continue to do this um, even as we speak today. The way we solve in this is our relationship with CARICOM. CARICOM has been up in arms. We need to be very proactive. And the friends of the Venezuelan regime that is befriending them when they're, uh, when they're uh, uh, taking advantage of countries like Guyana, um, I think we also need to look at those countries that are helping to support and, um, and, and prop up the Maduro regime as they take advantage of countries like ours. But we cannot overemphasize our relationship with our bilateral and multilateral um, agencies and our relationship or for our diplomatic um, efforts to try to thwart the Venezuelans and their and their aggression towards Guyana. So they're aggressing in, in our in our sea space, in our EEZ, in our airspace. Um, and it's a major problem for us and our relationship, our relationship, international relationship is what at this time is keeping them at bay. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Juan, do you want to address that? If not, I have a question for you from the audience. Well, look, I mean, just on Venezuela, um, maybe kind of to level set here, and I you know, obviously agree with everything that Dr. Borin and, uh, and, uh, and Guevia said, is, is that there's no, there's no silver bullet to the situation in, in Venezuela. There's no switch that is going to be flipped. And I think one of the pieces of magical realism that I think is uh, prevails on Venezuela is that is that kind of the concept of all options are on the table, so it's sort of expecting some sort of magical solution to the situation in the country, and, and that that solution does not exist. Um, this incredibly challenging uh, political, humanitarian, and economic crisis that has major regional implications and. Um, you know, is it impacting, uh, you know, important allies like like Colombia and, and Guyana? Um, the the second piece of I think magical realism associated with with Venezuela is is when when there are, there are some also elements that try to ignore what's actually happening inside of that country, or or try to pretend that it isn't happening, which is that people are literally you know not able to feed, put food on the table. They don't have access to, to medicine. Entire swaths of Venezuelan countryside are, are actually, you know, uh, under the control of the ELN or the FARC 10th, as we've seen um, recently in fighting between the Venezuelan uh, armed forces and, and the FARC. And then the third is, you know, and that uh, um, 
but but look, just in terms of just the U.S. political approach, very briefly, is um, the you know the president has made very clear that he um, that Nicolas Maduro is a, is a dictator and that the elections of May 2018 were not free and fair. So what is what is the act, the next step? We have a, a very robust sanctions regime uh, on the country, but we also um, I think the third piece of magical realism is that sanctions are a solution. They've never anywhere in the world, any study, um, uh, academic study that has been done has, has that ever shown that sanctions ever lead to regime change. They can, they can push somebody to a negotiating table, but they don't change bad behavior in the absence of a broader and more comprehensive approach. And so the approach that we are taking to, to Venezuela is number one, supporting the Venezuelan people inside and outside of the country. And that's why the president uh, granted temporary protected status to Venezuelans and is doing everything possible to try to support and address the humanitarian situation, including by supporting Colombia. The second one is that this has to be a multilateral approach. And so expanding the international consensus um, in favor of a free and fair um, election in Venezuela, starting with a humanitarian uh, question is I think gonna be key. And we have to be able to bring a much broader set kind of participants of the international community um, to, to promote that that end, um, and uh, you know, but also I think uh, the emphasis on human rights and combating corruption. So we are going to continue to press for the release of political prisoners. Um, we are going to uh, the billions that have been stolen from the Venezuelan people is something that this administration, consistent with the Verdad Act that was uh, written by Senator Menendez and co-sponsored by nearly twenty Democrats and Republicans to try to make sure that we're, we're following that as our blueprint and going after the ill-gotten gains uh, that have been stolen from, from the mouths of, uh, um, of the Venezuelan people is really uh, another area where we're gonna really focus, are focusing a lot of time and attention. But all of it has to be really geared toward promoting a negotiated outcome. You can call it an accord, you can call it whatever it is, but people have to sit down and have a conversation about what needs to happen next in the country. And it has to be something that in the expectation of the international community leads toward, uh, is a peaceful process that leads to free and fair elections so that Venezuelans once again are determining uh, their future. But, but I think Dr. Bordin is right. The presence of Russia, uh, of China, Hezbollah, Iran in, in Venezuela and their activities are a regional concern and, and, and they have implications for um, national security regionally. And it's something that is, is concerning and uh, you know uh, we need to respond to. Thank you, Juan. Let me stay with you, Juan, for a question from the audience. Uh, and I read, uh, does the US view the effort to supply COVID-19 vaccines to Latin American countries as competition for influence with Russia and China? No, because, uh, because look, um, I think the region is seeing a lot of this. First of all, uh, you know, in a couple of com early conversations I've had with leaders and foreign ministers and counterparts, they have they have asked, "Is is the U.S. going to see negatively our decision to accept vaccines from China or from Russia?" And the answer is no, because these countries we need to vaccinate these populations. Full stop. No conditions. Um, however. You know, China and Russia is using vaccine diplomacy to pressure countries to enter into certain agreements or political deals. That we that we are concerned with because that really is not how we should be responding to the pandemic, and it's not reflective of the shared responsibility um, um, and the need for us to work together to address these sort of common challenges. And but I think the region sees this for what it is. I mean, you only have to really look at the and use it a in a country that's I know very near and dear to you, uh, Frank, is Paraguay. Uh, that the uh, the question over vaccines has become a proxy war over the recognition of Taiwan or China, and, and frankly, that's that's not what um, our citizens want from us. So we don't see it as a competition because when the United States um, pivots, and it, we've already started that, and um, as we've talked, there have actually been announcements that have come out of the White House in terms of our plans to, to share vaccines. The United States is gonna be the global leader in the pandemic response. And we're not gonna ask for anything in return for those vaccines. Not just that, but we wanna make sure that we're the countries of the region are preparing for future pandemics. So we're gonna support efforts to expand production capability 
so that countries, when they inevitably are going to need to get that booster shot, we're not going through this again. Um, but then, because our a lot of these institutions that were developed in the 60s are struggling to, to address some of these challenges, is really working to kind of reaffirm um, the importance of the inter-American system and make sure that it is strong and able to respond to, to these sorts of crises. Great, thank you, Juan. Uh, Rafael, I have a, a question for you from the audience. Another tough question for you, Rafael. And it's sort of bringing several questions together. You uh, mentioned China multiple times in your interventions today. Yet China has an important presence in, in Colombia and in many other countries, particularly in the technological space, 5G uh, uh, infrastructure. Um, how do you reconcile those views uh, between your concern about the threat from China uh, and, um, in a sense, the presence that we're seeing in China, particularly in the technological, not in the trade space, but particularly in the building of the region's technological infrastructure? Yeah, it's a good question. Digámoslo de la siguiente manera. Independiente del país de que se trata. En el caso colombiano, eh, lo que debe primar es eh, el interés nacional de Colombia, que tiene que ver, conforme lo señala la Constitución, con su soberanía, con su independencia, con su integridad territorial, con su autonomía como Estado, con la vigencia plena de, de los mínimos que se requieren para que eh, Colombia siga siendo una nación libre e independiente del escenario internacional. En ese sentido, cualquier elemento que tenga que ver con relaciones internacionales, relaciones comerciales, pues tiene que observarse desde, el punto, desde ese punto de vista de los intereses nacionales. Cualquier actividad comercial eh, que implique restricciones a esos intereses nacionales o posibles afectaciones a la seguridad nacional, no solamente en el ámbito propio de la defensa nacional, sino con relación al control que debe tener Colombia sobre recursos esenciales como el agua, la diversidad y el medio ambiente, debe ser evaluada y por tanto debe ser rechazada. En el caso específico eh, de las eh, eh, tecnologías, eh, de los avances en ciencia y tecnología, también eso pasa o la valoración que nosotros debemos hacer en materia de la cooperación militar que tenemos con países aliados y los intereses comunes que tenemos con esos países aliados. Por supuesto, cualquier iniciativa que pueda atar estos intereses comunes no podría ser aceptada o no lo será por parte del gobierno del presidente Duque. Gran parte de la eh, seguridad y de la estabilidad de Colombia en un contexto tan complejo como el que vivimos, no solamente por la pandemia, sino por eh, dificultades de orden eh, político regional, pero también por la presencia de intereses eh, extracontinentales en la región, vinculados a ánimos expansionistas de dichas eh, potencias, solamente se puede absorber con una política de alianzas clara y transparente con las democracias de la región. Democracias que ven eh, los mismos riesgos a su seguridad nacional de situaciones como las que acabamos de señalar. Quisiera responderle de esa manera, eh, Fran, poniendo, digamos, todos los elementos de juicio que se deben tener en cuenta desde mi perspectiva particular frente a una eh, pregunta como la que me hace. Excellent, Rafael. Muchas gracias. So I have another question. This one is for Juan, but I, I'd like uh, Jerry to respond because it deals with the Caribbean. Uh, Juan, what is the Biden administration's plan towards the full optimization of the U.S. Caribbean Strategic Engagement Act of 2016 for the English-speaking Caribbean countries? So I'll have also Jerry respond to that after you've Need yeah. Thank you, Frank, for that question. I'll be very brief. So look, uh, the uh, Secretary Blinken uh, spoke with, um, with, his, uh, 
with the leaders of the of the Caribbean in, in April, and then uh, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan uh, spoke with uh, with the um, with his counterparts as well. Um, I think it was a couple of weeks ago to start that conversation. Uh, I think you know the the vice then Vice President Biden is somebody who was very engaged uh, in the Caribbean, as you know he launched the Caribbean Energy Security Initiative, um, and um, you know we we actually were in close touch with uh, then Chairman Engel in his effort to actually pass this uh, legislation uh, on the Caribbean. And so um, our plans are to make sure that we have a, a kind of um, broad-based engagement with the Caribbean that is not just traditional security issues, but looks at the impact of climate change uh, that, uh, that looks to um, also um, uh, kind of promote economic prosperity is, is a region that has been incredibly impacted by the pandemic. So making sure that there's a pandemic response, but also working to ensure that, again, a green recovery that invests in um, promoting energy security in the Caribbean as it looks to, to recover from the pandemic is something that's going to be key. So I think we want to try to develop a, a very broad-based approach to, to, to the region. And in the conversation that um, Jake Sullivan had uh, with CARICOM, he, uh, he announced that the president looked to actually having a conversation with his counterparts um, in, the near, in the near future. Don't have a date for that, but uh, when that sort of happens, it's basically a, a homework assignment for us to get to work to make sure that that engagement is one that um, is as ambitious as possible. Over. Thank you, Juan. So Jerry, if you could also address the question of the U.S. Caribbean Engagement Act, but also a second question, very important question that came up in the in the chat, which is the question of illegal mining, particularly uh, in Guyana. Well, first of all, the issue with the US uh, Caribbean relations, it actually coincides with Guyana US relations and more than any time else now, um, that is so important. And I think I, I agree with Juan when he said, and keep, keep the Caribbean safe, keep the people safe in terms even with the COVID and, and it will keep America safe. So keep us safe and secure, keep our democracies um, secure, and it will, it will help keep America safe. Um, and so when, when we, if we talk about the COVID response and the, 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 the large aid that Guyana is getting from the US to fight the COVID, I think it's helping us tremendously. The relationship with CARICOM and the United States and, and that initiative is vitally important and the discussion between President Biden and the leaders of the, Car of the Caribbean is crucial at this time, especially with the change of the economic fortune that is going to happen in Guyana and the influx of U.S. businesses that is going to be here. Already we have hundreds of U.S. businesses looking to set up businesses in Guyana and keeping the Caribbean safe and keeping Guyana safe, whether it's safe and whether our democracy must be robust and safe, our economies, our national security must be safe. I think it's vital at this time. Um, and so I think we are behind the power curve where that relationship and the, I think the president of the United States needs to urgently meet with the CARICOM leaders and start a discussion on national security and the other uh, issues of prosperity in the Caribbean. In terms of illegal mining, um, we have um, aspects of illegal mining, but it's a lot of it is happening from uh, with, with Brazilian miners. We haven't had any, um, any signs of the Venezuelans doing illegal mining in Guyana as well. But what we do have is the syndicatus crossing the border from Venezuela into Guyana and exercising and, and involving themselves in, a, in extortion with our, with our local miners. Part of the problem we face, of course, is our inability to police that border, whether we're talking about, about airborne radar, whether we're talking about fixed base radars, or we're talking about drones eye in the sky. Um, and right now we are only a $4 billion economy, but in 10 years, we are going to be a $30 billion economy, a $40 billion economy. And so we have to start preparing for that influx. We have, we have the Chinese doing manganese mining in Guyana. We have the Chinese involved in gold mining in Guyana, in massive and in, in large scale mining. Um, we have some Russian entities involved in mining in Guyana. We are keeping, very, we are keeping a very close eye on their activities in Ghana from a position of environment and a position of national security as well. So, um, but we have had no major issue with Venezuelan legal mining. We do have it with the, with, the, with the Brazilians as we speak. 
Thank you, Jerry. Uh, Rafael, uh, let me turn to you on the question of mining illegal mining as well. I know it is an important issue that, that, you're, that the Duque government is grappling with uh, as, as the sí. previous governments have. Sí, so claro. if you could address that. Sí, sobre ese tema. Sí, eh, nosotros en, en Colombia en el Plan Nacional de Desarrollo, que es la ley eh, que fija el planeamiento y las líneas de política del gobierno para los cuatro años, establecimos que el agua, la biodiversidad y el medio ambiente son el interés eh, nacional principal y prevalente de Colombia. Es la primera vez eh, que el gobierno de Colombia con el Congreso aprueban una definición de este tipo. Luego los temas relacionados con el cambio climático y en particular con la protección de la Amazonía y de nuestros recursos naturales, se convirtieron en un elemento central de la política donde hemos articulado desde el Ministerio de Relaciones Exteriores iniciativas como el Pacto de Leticia y desde el Ministerio de Medio Ambiente y el Ministerio de Defensa Nacional eh, con el Ministerio de Justicia toda una estrategia en materia de despliegue de capacidades para proteger eh, de la deforestación la selva amazónica. Uno de los elementos eh, que afectan en mayor medida el agua, la biodiversidad y el medio ambiente, además de los cultivos de coca, tiene que ver precisamente con la extracción ilícita de minerales. En varias regiones de Colombia, como el sur de Bolívar, al norte, o el Bajo Cauca Antioqueño, también al norte, cerca de la frontera con Panamá, o al sur, en el área del Triángulo de Telenví, en el departamento de Nariño, cerca de la frontera con Ecuador, tenemos serios fenómenos de extracción ilícita de minerales. Esto tiene que ver con un fenómeno de delito transnacional. No se trata simplemente de organizaciones criminales colombianas, sino que están articuladas con organizaciones de varios eh, países, inclusive eh, de países eh, como, como Brasil, donde hay presencia de bandas delincuenciales eh, hace más de una década en eh, actividades de extracción y de minerales en el departamento del Valle del Cauca. Lo que hemos encontrado es que esto tiene que ver con una visión más amplia para el problema y es cómo logramos la disrupción de las economías ilícitas. Trátese de las vinculadas al narcotráfico o en este caso particular a la extracción ilícita de minerales. La legislación, digamos, tiene que, en el caso colombiano, que mejorarse y las capacidades para poder enfrentar este, este problema porque el comercio de oro es libre en Colombia y traficar oro es eh, sencillo relativamente respecto al tráfico de cocaína o, al, o, o a la trata de personas. Se facilita mucho la movilidad del oro y eso hace que este sea una actividad económica que en algunos casos, dependiendo del mercado internacional, puede ser mucho más rentable que la coca. Lo cierto es que lograr la disrupción de la economía lista de la extracción de, eh, de, la extracción de minerales es fundamental porque de ello también depende lograr dos cosas más y es la desarticulación eh, o la posibilidad de que no subsistan grupos armados organizados. Hoy eh, eh, las disidencias de las FARC tienen presencia donde hay economías ilícitas, sea de cultivos de coca, sea de marihuana o sea de extracción ilícita de minerales. El Clan del Golfo, Organización del Narcotráfico, también tiene presencia en áreas de extracción ilícita de minerales. El grupo terrorista ELN, tiene presencia en disputa de áreas de cultivos de coca, pero también de extracción ilícita de minerales. El centro de gravedad de estas organizaciones tiene que ver las ilícitas. Por eso para nosotros es un tema fundamental y creemos que debería hacerlo en un contexto de cooperación internacional. Gracias, Rafael. Well, we've really run out of time. Uh, as expected, this was an incredible session. I want to thank uh, Rafael, uh, Jerry, and Juan for uh, this discussion. We covered a lot of ground. Thank you all for your questions. Uh, um, Brian, uh, I think you would agree this met all expectations. So with that, let me turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mora. Uh, absolutely an excellent discussion uh, with an excellent group of professionals and intellectuals. I think we covered a tremendously wide aperture on the security landscape across the Americas. Uh, and we probably could have spent the rest of the day in this discussion with, with, with this particular group. Uh, I wanna thank all those who joined us on day one. Uh, we are back here at 11 a.m. 
tomorrow morning with the Atlantic Council for a panel discussion on the impact of climate change on security in the Americas, followed by a fireside chat between former Costa Rican President uh, Luis Guillermo Solis, currently uh, serving as the acting director of FIU's Latin American and Caribbean Center, uh, and the current Costa Rican VP, uh, Vice President F.C. Campbell Barr. So we're really excited to, uh, for, tomorrow's, um, for tomorrow's sessions. Before we end for the day, I want to give a, a quick shout out to our partners at U.S. Southern Command, Atlanta Council, Council of the Americas, and others that really helped shape this year's program, as well as our partners across Florida International University. I also want to note that this conference was brought to you in part by LAC's U.S. Department of Education Title VI grant and the Center for International Business Education and Research in our College of Business. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, this concludes day one. Thanks again to all who joined us and I look forward to more great dialogue to come throughout the rest of the week. Thank you everyone.